Fortune in good manners. Give a boy a dress and accomplishments, and you give him the mastery of palaces and fortunes wherever he goes. He has not the trouble of earning or owning them. They solicit him to enter and possess. Emerson. With hat in hand, one gets on in the world. German proverb. What thou wilt, thou must rather enforce it with thy smile, than hew to it with thy sword. Shakespeare. Politeness has been compared to an air cushion, which, although there is apparently nothing in it, eases our jolts wonderfully. George L. Carey. Bath's good, but breeding's better. Scotch proverb. Conduct is three fourths of life. Matthew Arnold. Why the deuce do ye olders e down like that? asked a Cockney sergeant major angrily, when a worthy fellow soldier wished to be reinstated in a position from which he had been dismissed. Has he es been an officer e bought to know how to beave yourself better? What use you be as a non commissioned officer if he didn't dare look his men in the face? If a man wants to be a soldier, I say, let him cock his chin up, switch his stick about a bit, and give a crack hover the e to anybody who comes fooling round him else he might just as well be a Methodist parson. The English is somewhat rude, but it expresses pretty forcibly the fact that a good bearing is indispensable to success as a soldier. Mean and manner have much to do with our influence and reputation in any walk of life. Don't you wish you had my power? asked the east wind of the Zephyr. Why, when I start they hail me by storm signals all along the coast. I can twist off a ship's mast as easily as you can waft thistle down. With one sweep of my wing I strew the coast from Labrador to Cape Horn with shattered ship timber. I can lift and have often lifted the Atlantic. I am the terror of all invalids, and to keep me from piercing to the very marrow of their bones, men cut down forests for their fires and explore the mines of continents for coal to feed their furnaces. Under my breath the nations crouch in sepulchres. Don't you wish you had my power? Zephyr made no reply, but floated from out the bowers of the sky, and all the rivers and lakes and seas, all the forests and fields, all the beasts and birds and men smiled at its coming. Gardens bloomed, orchards ripened, silver wheat fields turned to gold, fleecy clouds went sailing in the lofty heaven, the pinions of birds and the sails of vessels were gently wafted onward, and health and happiness were everywhere. The foliage and flowers and fruits and harvests, the warmth and sparkle and gladness and beauty and life were the only answers Zephyr gave to the insolent question of the proud but pitiless east wind. The story goes that Queen Victoria once expressed herself to her husband in rather a despotic tone, and Prince Albert, whose manly self-respect was smarting at her words, sought the seclusion of his own apartment, closing and locking the door. In about five minutes someone knocked. Who is it? inquired the prince. It is I, open to the Queen of England, haughtily responded Her Majesty. There was no reply. After a long interval there came a gentle tapping and the low spoken words, It is I, Victoria, your wife. Is it necessary to add that the door was opened, or that the disagreement was at an end? It is said that civility is to a man what beauty is to a woman, it creates an instantaneous impression in his behalf. The monk Basil, according to a quaint old legend, died while under the ban of excommunication by the Pope, and was sent in charge of an angel to find his proper place in the netherworld. But his genial disposition and great conversational powers won friends wherever he went. The fallen angels adopted his manner and even the good angels went a long way to see him and live with him. He was removed to the lowest depths of Hades, but with the same result. His inborn politeness and kindness of heart were irresistible, and he seemed to change the hell into a heaven. At length the angel returned with the monk, saying that no place could be found in which to punish him. He still remained the same basil. So his sentence was revoked, and he was sent to heaven and canonized as a saint. The Duke of Marlborough wrote English badly and spelled it worse, yet he swayed the destinies of empires. 
the charm of his manner was irresistible and influenced all Europe. His fascinating smile and winning speech disarmed the fiercest hatred and made friends of the bitterest enemies. A gentleman took his daughter of 16 to Richmond to witness the trial of his bitter personal enemy, Aaron Burr, whom he regarded as an arch-traitor. But she was so fascinated by Burr's charming manner that she sat with his friends. Her father took her from the courtroom and locked her up, but she was so overcome by the fine manner of the accused that she believed in his innocence and prayed for his acquittal. To this day, said she fifty years afterwards, I feel the magic of his wonderful deportment. Madame Ricamia was so charming that when she passed around the box at the church Saint Roche in Paris, 20,000 francs were put into it. At the great reception to Napoleon on his return from Italy, the crowd caught sight of this fascinating woman and almost forgot to look at the great hero. Please, madam, whispered a servant to Madame de Maintenon at dinner, one anecdote more, for there is no roast today. She was so fascinating in manner and speech that her guests appeared to overlook all the little discomforts of life. According to St. Beuve, the privileged circle at Coppet after making an excursion returned from Chambery in two coaches. Those arriving in the first coach had a rueful experience to relate a terrific thunderstorm, shocking roads, and danger and gloom to the whole company. The party in the second coach heard their story with surprise, of thunderstorm, of steeps, of mud, of danger, they knew nothing, no, they had forgotten earth, and breathed a purer air. Such a conversation between Madame de Stael and Madame Ricamia and Benjamin Constant and Schlegel. They were all in a state of delight. The intoxication of the conversation had made them insensible to all notice of weather or rough roads. If I were queen, said Madame Tess, I should command Madame de Stael to talk to me every day. When she had passed, as Longfellow wrote of Evangeline, it seemed like the ceasing of exquisite music. Madame de Stael was anything but beautiful, but she possessed that indefinable something before which mere conventional beauty cowers, commonplace and ashamed. Her hold upon the minds of men was wonderful. They were the creatures of her will, and she shaped careers as if she were omnipotent. Even the Emperor Napoleon feared her influence over his people so much that he destroyed her writings and banished her from France. In the words of Whittier it could be said of her as might be said of any woman. Our homes are cheerier for her sake, our dooryards brighter blooming, and all about the social air is sweeter for her coming. A guest for two weeks at the house of Arthur M. Cavanaugh, M. P., who was without arms or legs, was very desirous of knowing how he fed himself but the conversation and manner of the host were so charming that the visitor was scarcely conscious of his deformity. When Dickens entered a room, said one who knew him well, it was like the sudden kindling of a big fire, by which everyone was warmed. It is said that when Gertie entered a restaurant people would lay down their knives and forks to admire him. Philip of Maston, after hearing the report of Demosthenes' famous oration, said, had I been there he would have persuaded me to take up arms against myself. Henry Clay was so graceful and impressive in his manner that a Pennsylvania tavern keeper tried to induce him to get out of the stagecoach in which they were riding, and make a speech to himself and his wife. I don't think much of Choate's spread eagle talk, said a simple-minded member of a jury that had given five successive verdicts to the great advocate, but I call him a very lucky lawyer, for there was not one of those five cases that came before us where he wasn't on the right side. His manner as well as his logic was irresistible. When Edward Everett took a professor's chair at Harvard after five years of study in Europe, he was almost worshipped by the students. His manner seemed touched by that exquisite grace seldom found except in women of rare culture. His great popularity lay in a magical atmosphere which every one felt, but no one could describe, and which never left him. A New York lady had just taken her seat in a car on a train bound for Philadelphia, 
when a somewhat stout man sitting just ahead of her lighted a cigar. She coughed and moved uneasily, but the hints had no effect, so she said tartly, you probably are a foreigner, and do not know that there is a smoking car attached to the train. Smoking is not permitted here. The man made no reply, but threw his cigar from the window. What has her astonishment when the conductor told her, a moment later, that she had entered the private car of General Grant. She withdrew in confusion, but the same fine courtesy which led him to give up his cigar was shown again as he spared her the mortification of even a questioning glance, still less of a look of amusement, although she watched his dumb, immovable figure with apprehension until she reached the door. Julian Ralph, after telegraphing an account of President Arthur's fishing trip to the Thousand Islands, returned to his hotel at two o'clock in the morning, to find all the doors locked. With two friends who had accompanied him, he battered at a side door to wake the servants, but what was his chagrin when the door was opened by the President of the United States? Why, that's all right, said Mr. Arthur when Mr. Ralph asked his pardon. You wouldn't have got in till morning if I had not come. No one is up in the house but me. I could have sent my colored boy, but he had fallen asleep and I hated to wake him. The late King Edward, when Prince of Wales, the first gentleman in Europe, invited an eminent man to dine with him. When coffee was served, the guest, to the consternation of the others, drank from his saucer. An open titter of amusement went round the table. The prince, quickly noting the cause of the untimely amusement, gravely emptied his cup into his saucer and drank after the manner of his guest. Silent and abashed, the other members of the princely household took the rebuke and did the same. Queen Victoria sent for Carlyle, who was a Scotch peasant, offering him the title of nobleman, which he declined, feeling that he had always been a nobleman in his own right. He understood so little of the manners at court that, when presented to the Queen, after speaking to her a few minutes, being tired, he said, let us sit down, madam, whereat the courtiers were ready to faint. But she was great enough, and gave a gesture that seated all her puppets in a moment. The Queen's courteous suspension of the rules of etiquette, and what it may have cost her, can be better understood from what an acquaintance of Carlyle said of him when he saw him for the first time. His presence, in some unaccountable manner, rasped the nerves. I expected to meet a rare being, and I left him feeling as if I had drunk sour wine, or had had an attack of seasickness. Some persons wield a scepter before which others seem to bow in glad obedience. But whence do they obtain such magic power? What is the secret of that almost hypnotic influence over people which we would give anything to possess? Courtesy is not always found in high places. Even royal courts furnish many examples of bad manners. At an entertainment given years ago by Prince Edward and the Princess of Wales, to which only the very cream of the cream of society was admitted, there was such pushing and struggling to see the princess, who was then but lately married, that, as she passed through the reception rooms, a bust of the princess royal was thrown from its pedestal and damaged, and the pedestal upset, and the ladies, in their eagerness to see the princess, actually stood upon it. When Catherine of Russia gave receptions to her nobles, she published the following rules of etiquette upon cards, gentlemen will not get drunk before the feast is ended. Noblemen are forbidden to strike their wives in company. Ladies of the court must not wash out their mouths in the drinking glasses, or wipe their faces on the damask, or pick their teeth with forks. But today the nobles of Russia have no superiors in manners. Etiquette originally meant the ticket or tag tied to a bag to indicate its contents. If a bag had this ticket it was not examined. From this the word passed to cards upon which were printed certain rules to be observed by guests. These rules were the ticket or the etiquette. To be the ticket, or, as it was sometimes expressed, to act or talk by the card, became the thing with the better classes. It was fortunate for Napoleon that he married Josephine before he was made commander-in-chief of the armies of Italy. Her fascinating manners and her wonderful powers of persuasion were more influential than the loyalty of any dozen men in France in attaching to him the adherents who would promote his interests. Josephine was to the drawing room and the salon what Napoleon was to the field a preeminent leader. 
the secret of her personality that made her the empress not only of the hearts of the Frenchmen, but also of the nations her husband conquered, has been beautifully told by herself. There is only one occasion, she said to a friend, in which I would voluntarily use the words, I will. Namely, when I would say, I will that all around me be happy. It was only a glad good morning, as she passed along the way, but it spread the morning's glory over the livelong day. A fine manner more than compensates for all the defects of nature. The most fascinating person is always the one of most winning manners, not the one of greatest physical beauty. The Greeks thought beauty was a proof of the peculiar favor of the gods, and considered that beauty only worth adorning and transmitting which was unmarred by outward manifestations of hard and haughty feeling. According to their ideal, beauty must be the expression of attractive qualities within, such as cheerfulness, benignity, contentment, charity, and love. Mirabeau was one of the ugliest men in France. It was said he had the face of a tiger pitted by smallpox, but the charm of his manner was almost irresistible. Beauty of life and character, as in art, has no sharp angles. Its lines seem continuous, so gently does curve melt into curve. It is sharp angles that keep many souls from being beautiful that are almost so. Our good is less good when it is abrupt, rude, ill-timed, or ill-placed. Many a man and woman might double their influence and success by a kindly courtesy and a fine manner. Tradition tells us that before Apelles painted his wonderful goddess of beauty which enchanted all Greece, he travelled for years observing fair women, that he might embody in his matchless Venus a combination of the loveliest found in all. So the good-mannered study, observe, and adopt all that is finest and most worthy of imitation in every cultured person they meet. Throw a bone to a dog, said a shrewd observer, and he will run off with it in his mouth, but with no vibration in his tail. Call the dog to you, pat him on the head, let him take the bone from your hand, and his tail will wag with gratitude. The dog recognizes the good deed and the gracious manner of doing it. Those who throw their good deeds should not expect them to be caught with a thankful smile. Ask a person at Rome to show you the road, said Dr. Guthrie of Edinburgh, and he will always give you a civil and polite answer, but ask any person a question for that purpose in this country, Scotland, and he will say, follow your nose and you will find it. But the blame is with the upper classes, and the reason why, in this country, the lower classes are not polite is because the upper classes are not polite. I remember how astonished I was the first time I was in Paris. I spent the first night with a banker, who took me to a pension, or, as we call it, a boarding house. When we got there, a servant girl came to the door, and the banker took off his hat, and bowed to the servant girl, and called her Mademoiselle, as though she were a lady. Now, the reason why the lower classes there are so polite is because the upper classes are polite and civil to them. A fine courtesy is a fortune in itself. The good-mannered can do without riches, for they have passports everywhere. All doors fly open to them, and they enter without money and without price. They can enjoy nearly everything without the trouble of buying or owning. They are as welcome in every household as the sunshine, and why not? For they carry light, sunshine, and joy everywhere. They disarm jealousy and envy, for they bear goodwill to everybody. Bees will not sting a man smeared with honey. A man's own good breeding, says Chesterfield, is the best security against other people's ill manners. It carries along with it a dignity that is respected by the most petulant. Ill breeding invites and authorizes the familiarity of the most timid. No man ever said a pert thing to the Duke of Marlborough, or a civil one to Sir Robert Walpole. The true gentleman cannot harbour those qualities which excite the antagonism of others, as revenge, hatred, malice, envy, or jealousy, for these poison the sources of spiritual life and shrivel the soul. Generosity of heart and a genial goodwill towards all are absolutely essential to him who would possess fine manners. Here is a man who is cross, crabbed, moody, sullen, silent, sulky, stingy, and mean with his family and servants. 
He refuses his wife a little money to buy a needed dress, and accuses her of extravagance that would ruin a millionaire. Suddenly the bell rings. Some neighbors call, what a change. The bear of a moment ago is as docile as a lamb. As by magic he becomes talkative, polite, generous. After the callers have gone, his little girl begs her father to keep on his company manners for a little while, but the sullen mood returns and his courtesy vanishes as quickly as it came. He is the same disagreeable, contemptible, crabbed bear as before the arrival of his guests. What friend of the great Dr. Johnson did not feel mortified and pained to see him eat like an Eskimo, and to hear him call men liars because they did not agree with him? He was called the Ursa Major, or Great Bear. Benjamin Rush said that when Goldsmith at a banquet in London asked a question about the American Indians, Dr. Johnson exclaimed, There is not an Indian in North America foolish enough to ask such a question. Sir, replied Goldsmith, there is not a savage in America rude enough to make such a speech to a gentleman. After Stephen A. Douglas had been abused in the Senate he rose and said, what no gentleman should say no gentleman need answer. Aristotle thus described a real gentleman more than 2000 years ago, the magnanimous man will behave with moderation under both good fortune and bad. He will not allow himself to be exalted he will not allow himself to be abased. He will neither be delighted with success, nor grieved with failure. He will never choose danger, nor seek it. He is not given to talk about himself or others. He does not care that he himself should be praised, nor that other people should be blamed. A gentleman is just a gentleman, no more, no less, a diamond polished that was first a diamond in the rough. A gentleman is gentle, modest, courteous, slow to take offense, and never giving it. He is slow to surmise evil, as he never thinks it. He subjects his appetites, refines his tastes, subdues his feelings, controls his speech, and deems every other person as good as himself. A gentleman, like porcelain ware, must be painted before he is glazed. There can be no change after it is burned in, and all that is put on afterwards will wash off. He who has lost all but retains his courage, cheerfulness, hope, virtue, and self-respect, is a true gentleman, and is rich still. You replace Dr. Franklin, I hear, said the French minister, Count de Virgins, to Mr. Jefferson, who had been sent to Paris to relieve our most popular representative. I succeed him, no man can replace him, was the felicitous reply of the man who became highly esteemed by the most polite court in Europe. You should not have returned their salute, said the master of ceremonies, when Clement XIV bowed to the ambassadors who had bowed in congratulating him upon his election. Oh, I beg your pardon, replied Clement. I have not been Pope long enough to forget good manners. Cowper says. A modest, sensible, and well-bred man would not insult me, and no other can. I never listen to calumnies, said Montesquieu, because if they are untrue I run the risk of being deceived, and if they are true, of hating people not worth thinking about. I think, says Emerson, Hans Anderson's story of the cobweb cloth woven so fine that it was invisible, woven for the king's garment, must mean manners, which do really clothe a princely nature. No one can fully estimate how great a factor in life is the possession of good manners, or timely thoughtfulness with human sympathy behind it. They are the kindly fruit of a refined nature, and are the open sesame to the best of society. Manners are what vex or soothe, exalt or debase, barbarize or refine us by a constant, steady, uniform, invincible operation like that of the air we breathe. Even power itself has not half the might of gentleness, that subtle oil which lubricates our relations with each other, and enables the machinery of society to perform its functions without friction. Have you not seen in the woods, in a late autumn morning, asks Emerson, a poor fungus, or mushroom, a plant without any solidity, nay, that seemed nothing but a soft mush or jelly, 
by its constant, total, and inconceivably gentle pushing, managed to break its way up through the frosty ground, and actually to lift a hard crust on its head. It is the symbol of the power of kindness. There is no policy like politeness, says Magoon, since a good manner often succeeds where the best tongue has failed. The art of pleasing is the art of rising in the world. The politest people in the world, it is said, are the Jews. In all ages they have been maltreated and reviled, and despoiled of their civil privileges and their social rights, yet are they everywhere polite and affable. They indulge in few or no recriminations, are faithful to old associations, more considerate of the prejudices of others than others are of theirs, not more worldly-minded and money-loving than people generally are and, everything considered, they surpass all nations in courtesy, affability, and forbearance. Men, like bullets, says Richter, go farthest when they are smoothest. Napoleon was much displeased on hearing that Josephine had permitted General Lorges, a young and handsome man, to sit beside her on the sofa. Josephine explained that, instead of its being General Lorges, it was one of the aged generals of his army, entirely unused to the customs of courts. She was unwilling to wound the feelings of the honest old soldier, and so allowed him to retain his seat. Napoleon commended her highly for her courtesy. President Jefferson was one day riding with his grandson, when they met a slave, who took off his hat and bowed. The president returned the salutation by raising his hat, but the grandson ignored the civility of the Negro. Thomas, said the grandfather, do you permit a slave to be more of a gentleman than yourself? Lincoln was the first great man I talked with freely in the United States, said Fred Douglas, who in no single instance reminded me of the difference between himself and me, of the difference in color. Eat at your own table, says Confucius, as you would eat at the table of the king. If parents were not careless about the manners of their children at home, they would seldom be shocked or embarrassed at their behavior abroad. James Russell Lowell was as courteous to a beggar as to a lord, and was once observed holding a long conversation in Italian with an organ grinder whom he was questioning about scenes in Italy with which they were each familiar. In hastily turning the corner of a crooked street in London, a young lady ran with great force against a ragged beggar boy and almost knocked him down. Stopping as soon as she could, she turned around and said very kindly, I beg your pardon, my little fellow, I am very sorry that I ran against you. The astonished boy looked at her a moment, and then, taking off about three quarters of a cap, made a low bow and said, while abroad, pleasant smile overspread his face, you have my parding, miss, and welcome, and welcome, and the next time you run ag in me, you can knock me clean down and I won't say a word. After the lady had passed on, he said to a companion, I say, Jim, it's the first time I ever heard anybody ask my parting, and it kind o' took me off my feet. Respect the burden, madam, respect the burden, said Napoleon, as he courteously stepped aside at St. Helena to make way for a labor bending under a heavy load, while his companion seemed inclined to keep the narrow path. A Washington politician went to visit Daniel Webster at Marshfield, Massachusetts, and, in taking a short cut to the house, came to a stream which he could not cross. Calling to a rough-looking farmer nearby, he offered a quarter to be carried to the other side. The farmer took the politician on his broad shoulders and landed him safely, but would not take the quarter. The old rustic presented himself at the house a few minutes later, and to the great surprise and chagrin of the visitor was introduced as Mr. Webster. Garrison was as polite to the furious mob that tore his clothes from his back and dragged him through the streets as he could have been to a king. He was one of the serenest souls that ever lived. Christ was courteous, even to his persecutors, and in terrible agony on the cross, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. St. Paul's speech before Agrippa is a model of dignified courtesy, as well as of persuasive eloquence. Good manners often prove a fortune to a young man. Mr. Butler, a merchant in Providence, uh, I, had once closed his store and was on his way home when he met a little girl who wanted a spool of thread. He went back, 
opened the store, and got the thread. This little incident was talked of all about the city and brought him hundreds of customers. He became very wealthy, largely because of his courtesy. Ross Winans of Baltimore owed his great success and fortune largely to his courtesy to two foreign strangers. Although his was but a fourth-rate factory, his great politeness in explaining the minutest details to his visitors was in such marked contrast with the limited attention they had received in large establishments that it won their esteem. The strangers were Russians sent by their char, who later invited Mr. Winans to establish locomotive works in Russia. He did so, and soon his profits resulting from his politeness were more than $100,000 a year. A poor curate saw a crowd of rough boys and men laughing and making fun of two aged spinsters dressed in antiquated costume. The ladies were embarrassed and did not dare enter the church. The curate pushed through the crowd, conducted them up the central aisle, and amid the titter of the congregation, gave them choice seats. These old ladies although strangers to him, at their death left the gentle curate a large fortune. Courtesy pays. Not long ago a lady met the late President Humphrey of Amherst College, and she was so much pleased with his great politeness that she gave a generous donation to the college. Why did our friend never succeed in business, asked a man returning to New York after years of absence, he had sufficient capital, a thorough knowledge of his business, and exceptional shrewdness and sagacity. He was sour and morose, was the reply, he always suspected his employees of cheating him, and was discourteous to his customers. Hence, no man ever put goodwill or energy into work done for him, and his patrons went to shops where they were sure of civility. Some men almost work their hands off and deny themselves many of the common comforts of life in their earnest efforts to succeed, and yet render success impossible by their cross-grained and gentlemanliness. They repel patronage, and, naturally, business which might easily be theirs goes to others who are really less deserving but more companionable. Bad manners often neutralize even honesty, industry, and the greatest energy, while agreeable manners win in spite of other defects. Take two men possessing equal advantages in every other respect, if one be gentlemanly, kind, obliging, and conciliating, and the other disobliging, rude, harsh, and insolent, the former will become rich while the boorish one will starve. A fine illustration of the business value of good manners is found in the Bon Marche, an enormous establishment in Paris where thousands of clerks are employed, and where almost everything is kept for sale. The two distinguishing characteristics of the house are one low price to all, and extreme courtesy. Mere politeness is not enough, the employees must try in every possible way to please and to make customers feel at home. Something more must be done than is done in other stores, so that every visitor will remember the Bon Marche with pleasure. By this course the business has been developed until it is said to be the largest of the kind in the world. Thank you, my dear, please call again, spoken to a little beggar girl who bought a penneth of snuff proved a profitable advertisement and made Lundy Foot a millionaire. Many persons of real refinement are thought to be stiff, proud, reserved, and haughty who are not, but are merely diffident and shy. It is a curious fact that diffidence often betrays us into discourtesies which our hearts abhor, and which cause us intense mortification and embarrassment. Excessive shyness must be overcome as an obstacle to perfect manners. It is peculiar to the Anglo-Saxon and the Teutonic races, and has frequently been a barrier to the highest culture. It is a disease of the finest organizations and the highest types of humanity. It never attacks the coarse and vulgar. Sir Isaac Newton was the shyest man of his age. He did not acknowledge his great discovery for years just for fear of attracting attention to himself. He would not allow his name to be used in connection with his theory of the moon's motion, for fear it would increase the acquaintances he would have to meet. George Washington was awkward and shy and had the air of a countryman. Archbishop Wat Ely was so shy that he would escape notice whenever it was possible. At last he determined to give up trying to cure his shyness, for why, he asked, should I endure this torture all my life, when, to his surprise, it almost entirely disappeared. 
Elihu Barut was so shy that he would hide in the cellar when his parents had company. Practice on the stage or lecture platform does not always eradicate shyness. David Garrick, the great actor, was once summoned to testify in court, and, though he had acted for 30 years with marked self-possession, he was so confused and embarrassed that the judge dismissed him. John B. Goff said that he could not rid himself of his early diffidence and shrinking from public notice. He said that he never went on the platform without fear and trembling, and would often be covered with cold perspiration. There are many worthy people who are brave on the street, who would walk up to a cannon's mouth in battle, but who are cowards in the drawing room, and dare not express an opinion in the social circle. They feel conscious of a subtle tyranny in society's code, which locks their lips and ties their tongues. Addison was one of the purest writers of English and a perfect master of the pen, but he could scarcely utter a dozen words in conversation without being embarrassed. Shakespeare was very shy. He retired from London at 40, and did not try to publish or preserve one of his plays. He took second or third-rate parts on account of his diffidence. Generally shyness comes from a person thinking too much about himself, which in itself is a breach of good breeding and wondering what other people think about him. I was once very shy, said Sidney Smith, but it was not long before I made two very useful discoveries, first, that all mankind were not solely employed in observing me, and next, that shamming was of no use, that the world was very clear-sighted, and soon estimated a man at his true value. This cured me. What a misfortune it is to go through life apparently encased in ice, yet all the while full of kindly, cordial feeling for one's fellow men. Shy people are always distrustful of their powers and look upon their lack of confidence as a weakness or lack of ability, when it may indicate quite the reverse. By teaching children early the arts of social life, such as boxing, horseback riding, dancing, elocution, and similar accomplishments, we may do much to overcome the sense of shyness. Shy people should dress well. Good clothes give ease of manner, and unlock the tongue. The consciousness of being well dressed gives a grace and ease of manner that even religion will not bestow, while inferiority of garb often induces restraint. As peculiarities in apparel are sure to attract attention, it is well to avoid bright colors and fashionable extremes, and wear plain, well-fitting garments of as good material as the purse will afford. Beauty in dress is a good thing, rail at it who may. But it is a lower beauty, for which a higher beauty should not be sacrificed. They love dress too much who give it their first thought, their best time, or all their money, who for it neglect the culture of the mind or heart, or the claims of others on their service, who care more for dress than for their character who are troubled more by an unfashionable garment than by a neglected duty. When Ezekiel Whitman, a prominent lawyer and graduate of Harvard, was elected to the Massachusetts legislature, he came to Boston from his farm in countryman's dress and went to a hotel in Boston. He entered the parlor and sat down when he overheard the remark between some ladies and gentlemen, ah, here comes a real homespun countryman. Here's fun. They asked him all sorts of queer questions, tending to throw ridicule upon him, when he arose and said, Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to wish you health and happiness, and may you grow better and wiser in advancing years, bearing in mind that outward appearances are deceitful. You mistook me, from my dress, for a country booby, while I, from the same superficial cause, thought you were ladies and gentlemen. The mistake has been mutual. Just then Governor Caleb Strong entered and called to Mr. Whitman, who, turning to the dumbfounded company, said, I wish you a very good evening. In civilized society, says Johnson, external advantages make us more respected. A man with a good coat upon his back meets with a better reception than he who has a bad one. One cannot but feel that God is a lover of the beautiful. He has put robes of beauty and glory upon all his works. Every flower is dressed in richness, every field blushes beneath a mantle of beauty, every star is veiled in brightness, every bird is clothed in the habiliments of the most exquisite taste. Some people look upon polished manners as a kind of affectation. 
They claim admiration for plain, solid, square, rugged characters. They might as well say that they prefer square, plain, unornamented houses made from square blocks of stone. St. Peter's is nonetheless strong and solid because of its elegant columns and the magnificent sweep of its arches, its carved and fretted marbles of matchless hues. Our manners, like our characters, are always under inspection. Every time we go into society we must step on the scales of each person's opinion, and the loss or gain from our last weight is carefully noted. Each mentally asks, is this person going up or down? Through how many grades has he passed? For example, young Brown enters a drawing room. All present weigh him in their judgment and silently say, this young man is gaining, he is more careful, thoughtful, polite, considerate, straightforward, industrious. Besides him stands young Jones. It is evident that he is losing ground rapidly. He is careless, indifferent, rough, does not look you in the eye, is mean, stingy, snaps at the servants, yet is overpolite to strangers. And so we go through life, tagged with these invisible labels by all who know us. I sometimes think it would be a great advantage if one could read these ratings of his associates. We cannot long deceive the world, for that other self, whoever stands in the shadow of ourselves holding the scales of justice, that telltale in the soul, rushes to the eye or into the manor and betrays us. But manners, while they are the garb of the gentleman, do not constitute or finally determine his character. Mere politeness can never be a substitute for moral excellence, any more than the bark can take the place of the heart of the oak. It may well indicate the kind of wood below, but not always whether it be sound or decayed. Etiquette is but a substitute for good manners and is often but their mere counterfeit. Sincerity is the highest quality of good manners. The following recipe is recommended to those who wish to acquire genuine good manners. Of unselfishness, three drams. Of the tincture of good cheer, one ounce. Of essence of heart's ease, three drams. Of the extract of the rose of Sharon, four ounces. Of the oil of charity, three drams, and no scruples. Of the infusion of common sense and tact, one ounce. Of the spirit of love, two ounces. The mixture to be taken whenever there is the slightest symptom of selfishness, exclusiveness, meanness, or I am better than you Ness. Pattern after him who gave the golden rule, and who was the first true gentleman that ever breathed.